All right, so yesterday we had our first midterm exam. The first question was electrophilic aromatic substitution. So if we look at the dimethyl amino group, is that electron donating or withdrawing? Donating. donating. So it's an ortho para director. These are electron withdrawing under acidic conditions, and why is that? Yeah, if it's under acidic conditions, you'll protonate your dimethyl amino group and it actually becomes a meta director. But in this case, we don't have any Bronsted acids, we just have a Lewis acid, so it's a, still going to be ortho para. Oop. So the product I would have done to avoid steric interference would have been to install the terp butyl group para to the dimethyl amino group. However, if you would have put it in one of the other ortho positions, you'd still be fine. Um, this position right here is very, very crowded. That one's not likely to occur. All right, the next one, we've got electrophilic aromatic substitution, specifically halogenation. And anisole is what sort of director? Moderate activator, which means we're going to get bromination in the para position. All right, the next one. I tried to give you guys a hint here by showing two boxes. What sort of intermediate are we going through? Yeah, benzene. 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 Sorry, I tried to make it a hint. So with your benzene intermediate, you end up losing some regiochemical control. And you get two different products out of that reaction. If we had a nitro group, where the methyl group is, what sort of reaction would that be? So if this methyl group were a nitro group, what sort of reaction would that be? Nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So this is elimination addition, and because of that, we lose regiochemical control. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. We're installing a sulfonate group. We need H2SO4, and what else? Fuming, what, what does fuming mean? <laughs> SO3. I'll accept fuming. I just want you guys to know that it, some people think fuming is literally hot sulfuric acid. It's not. Fuming sulfuric acid has sulfur trioxide dissolved in it. That's what makes it fuming. It's not just hot sulfuric acid. Sorry, Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would just do a substitution at the chlorine position. Yeah, if you have a strong deactivator where that methyl group is, like a nitro group, um, you change mechanisms and you go through nucleophilic aromatic substitution. You wouldn't get meta-substituted products in that case. All right, now we have friedel crafts acylation. We've got an ortho para director, so we'll get a ketone installed para to our isopropyl group. And then in the next one, we've got a Grignard reaction which is reviewed from last term, but we covered it this term. And you'll form your tertiary alcohol. So most of that should have been reviewed. The next one, we've got water and acid. In this case, we've got a ketone, but it's very, very electrophilic. Why is that? The fluorines are very electronegative. So in this case, the equilibrium will actually lie very far on the right, and we'll get a hydrate. All right, the next one, we've got two different carbonyl groups. We've got a ketone and an ester. Which one's more reactive? Ketone. Whoop. So the reason we would do this was, would be that now we've protected our ketone, we can do chemistry on the ester, um, and then deprotect our ketone and get it back to its original form by using uh, dilute acid. Yep. Can you explain why the, the ketone's more reactive than the ester? So ketones and aldehydes are a lot more reactive. We're going to start getting into um, derivatives of carboxylic acids, and they're a lot less electrophilic. They uh, have very different reactivity than ketones and aldehydes. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of resonance occurring, so it's just not as electrophilic. All right, so let's do the next one backwards. The next one w looks like a Wittig reaction, which means that it started from a ketone. And if we want to make this ketone, you could have had an alkene like that, or you could have had a symmetric alkene. Either one would be fine. That's an ozonolysis reaction from um, earlier on in the year. All right, the next one, we've got a what looks like a Wolf-Kishner reduction. And so in order to form our imine, we have to have a ketone, which is cyclopentanone. And then our final product is what? It's just the pentane. Cyclopentane. So in this case, we remove the carbonyl group. All right, the next one, we've got Bayer-Villiger oxi oxidation. Ugh. The hydrogen is more likely to migrate than the phenyl group. So we can actually convert benzaldehyde into a carboxylic acid. All right, the next one, we've got this as our major product because we've got a methyl group that's ortho para activating, and then we've got an electron withdrawing group that's meta uh, directing. So the first step is to make whoop, make our nitrating agent. So I'm just gonna. I guess I'll draw it all out. So the first step is going to be protonation of your alcohol. How come that alcohol grabs it over the oxygen that has a negative charge? That's a good question. And the key is this next step. I mean, I did that. Once we have that protonated, this can clamp down and kick that off as a leaving group. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, you forgot your oh. <laughs> You guys are getting ahead of me here. All right. Now we've got our nitronium ion that's the active electrophile in this case. And we had, was it carboxylic acid? Yep. And so in this case, we can show our meta position attacking, kick off our or kick electrons onto that oxygen. Now we've got our nitro group here with the hydrogen. So you said our meta position. Technically, it's in an ortho position because the other one is deactivated. Well, it depends on which uh, substituent you're comparing it to. Okay. It's meta to the deactivator, so I guess it's ortho to the activator, yeah. And you can draw all the resonance structures for these. Um, the reason I put that in there was so that you could try to justify regiochemistry. If you didn't include resonance structures, that's fine. I'm grading you on the overall mechanism. Um, so in order to explain the stability of this carbocation, you can delocalize that positive charge. And then the water, in this case, can come and re-aromatize. And you end up with your final product. No, I just said, if you didn't, it's fine. But the resonance uh, delocalization explains why that's the major product and not the other product on the top. So I throw that in there once in a while just to get you guys thinking, especially if you're stuck on identifying the regiochemistry. All right, the next one. This was pretty straightforward, I thought. First one, we'll do ALCL3. So we'll do friedel crafts alkylation. This can be a hard reaction to control, so we need to control our equivalence of uh, terbutyl chloride. And then in the next one, we've got fuming sulfuric acid. 
to block our para group. SO3H. Then we can add in our bromine. And just for clarification, you could do bromine first and then do your. No. Nope, we want to block our para position. But bromine's a ortho para activator too, so you would get a lot of para product. But not blocking. Oh, you're talking about bromine and then protect para to the yeah, that would be fine too. There's more than one way to answer most of these. And then how do we remove it? All right, and now we've got our final product. All right, the next one, there is actually uh, some debate on it, and I'll admit that I was taught myself incorrectly, and I've passed on some semi-incorrect information to use, and we'll address that. And everybody should get three points right there. That's, that's four points right there. Make up six points. Six, yeah. I'll try to be kind of low, but I'll go with six, too. All right. So we'll do Friedel Crafts acylation. And then what I was going to do is methyl chloride and ALCL3 because now we've got a meta director on there. And I actually dug through about six different textbooks yesterday. And there's disagreement about this. Some textbooks say if you have any deactivating group on your ring that you will not get a friedel crafts reaction to work. Other books say if you have a strongly deactivating group, you won't get a friedel crafts reaction to work. The reality is the truth lies somewhere in between and the yields vary. So this reaction with methyl chloride with the friedel crafts reaction would be very low because the ring's deactivated. It doesn't necessarily mean that it won't happen. It just means it's not going to be the best reaction. So that was my fault. Um, ideally, you want to do friedel crafts reactions on electron-activated benzene rings, not uh, rings that are donated. And then the next one. Uh, halides are kind of the cutoff, which most people consider. Um, so if you've got any meta directors on there, it's not usually going to be a high-yielding reaction. All right, the next one we've got. Whoop. Our illid reagent. And we can get to our final product that way. And because I said you could already use functionalized carbons, you could have just shown that illid. All right, the last one. Let me double check. Sorry, I gotta double check my groups here. We'll do a Friedel Crafts acylation. Oop, we need ALCL3 there. And then we do HNO3, H2SO4 to get our nitro group installed meta. And then what's this next step going to be to get from our ketone to our enamine? Uh, yep, a secondary amine, which in this case would be dimethylamine with catalytic acid. Oops, sorry. And, uh I goofed up here. There we go. And you end up with your enamine because now you've got a secondary amine. All right, so those were our three answers. Last but not least. I just want to be, I'll be happy. I'll clean your office. <laughs> You'll clean my office. <laughs> You'll clean my dog. That's weird. <laughs> I'll walk in, I'll walk in every day. 
I don't even have a dog. <laughs> I don't know anyone that cleans fish. All right, so we can protonate in our first step. So this is hydrolysis of an enamine. And then water can add into that. All right, and then we can have water grab a proton. Yeah, you could have used HA or A. And then what's the next step? Protonate your amine. So our Nitrogen gets protonated. Our nitrogen now has a positive charge. And then our next step is the oxygen can kick down, pop off our amine. So now we've got our amine floating around. And then the last step will be the amine grabbing this proton. And we get to our ketone. Could you send off water grabbing the proton? Yeah, in this case, water or um, the amine is going to be more basic. Many of you saw this already with the sapling problems that the amines were always protonated at the end. Nope. Uh, amines are more basic than um, water. Yep. I mean, the reality is there's a lot of stuff going on in equilibrium. So. Yep. All right. And for naming it, we would number the longest chain. And this would be 4 methyl 2 pentanone. The key being the suffix own for that. Yep. So I told you guys you need to know all of the mechanisms forward and backwards, and I said the intermediates are all exactly the same. And I wanted you guys to try going through a lot of these on your own, going back and forth from imines to enamines and the same. I just have to see how everybody did it. If you goofed up on a small step, but you had all the correct intermediates, that'll just be a small deduction. Small if your arrows were. Like 5, 1, I don't know. I have to see it. It's all on a case by case basis. Yep. What are these going to be graded by? Uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so let's start our new chapter because I don't want to fall behind. And we're moving into carboxylic acids. I did all right, Dr. Yeah. I feel like you guys are my track team and I've gotten you guys in shape now and I, I feel proud like sending you to a race. <laughs> All right, so introduction to carboxylic acids. First thing we're going to do is very quickly go into basic nomenclature. I'm not going to go into in-depth nomenclature, just the basics. So let's take this carboxylic acid. Which side do you think we number from, the right or the left? Right. 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 Go one, two, three, four, five, six. So the parent chain is what? Hex. So it's hex an, indicating it has six carbons. And then it would be oic acid. And so the suffix? For most carboxylic acids, it's going to end in oic acid. And there are a few other accepted names. J 
Just like with ketones and aldehydes, we had a bunch of other names like formaldehyde that don't follow the IUPAC rules. The same is true for carboxylic acids. And the first one, whoa, there we go, is this one, which is called formic acid. I was a malicious kid growing up, and I used to go out and squash ants in my yard all the time. You know what they say about kids? Has anybody done that? Abuse yeah, animals. <laughs> Have you ever smelled your hand after you squash an ant? No. no. You get this really pungent acid smell. That's formic acid. So that's what ants use. Um, so if you've ever crushed an ant, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, the next one, we've got a methyl group on there. So the whole group on the left is an acetate group. So what do you think this is called? Acetic acid, yeah. Yes, I do. So we've got acetic acid. The next one, so acetic acid is what's in vinegar um, or spoiled wine. You would know, right, Professor? I would know. Um, the next one, we've got three carbons in there, so it has the propane prefix. Yep, this is propanoic acid. What's in that? Propionic. Oh, sorry, propionic acid. I always mess this one up. Thank you. Propionic acid. If you say propanoic acid, people know exactly what you're talking about, but this is one that can be spelled both ways. Then there's butyric acid. Again, spelled slightly differently than the normal IUPAC nomenclature. This is B U T Y R I C. And then one we've already seen before benzoic acid. And then there's also a slight deviation, too, where if you have a carboxylic acid coming off of, whoops, it should be an OH, coming off of a cycloalkane. Whoop. This would just be called cyclohexane carboxylic acid. Yeah, they kind of gave up at that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now there's a list of diacids, too. I'm assuming a lot of you are going to go into biochemistry or related classes. Um, and diacids are common in biochemistry. So I want to go through these names. I'll change my degree if you give me the... I want to be an now. Not me. All right, so the first diacid has two carbons, so it's the simple, simplest diacid, and this is called oxalic acid. The next one has three carbons. And this is called malonic acid. Next one has four carbons. And this is called succinic acid. And a lot of these actually get um, converted into other biochemistry names, so the numbering for the carbons translates over into some analogs. Next one has more. One more carbon. This is called glutaric acid. And I'll do a, a couple more. So let me draw these both in here. Oh, 
we're just adding one carbon onto each of these. And this is called um, adipic acid. And this is camelic acid. And when I was an undergrad, I had a hell of a time remembering these names. So I came up with my own study tool, or mnemonic, I guess. And the mnemonic I came up with was, oh my, such good apple pie. <laughs> so I'm going to pass this gem on to you. So, oh my, such good apple pie. Exactly. So you can start from your simplest diacid, oxalic, and then you can remember my is the next word, malonic, succinic, glutaric, adipic, and pamelic. Malonic. For which one? Uh, e, P I M E L I C. So that's a, a good thing to remember for your biochem classes. Um, there are some accepted IUPAC names for these, but most people use um, the traditional names that are used in biochemistry. All right, let's go briefly into structures and properties for these. In biochemistry, what you look at is metabolic pathways, but the, instead of having a reagent do it through the reaction, you typically have enzymes involved in doing the reaction. But oftentimes, the chemistry is very, very similar to what we see. So hydrolysis reactions, you see that all the time in biochemistry. So that's why I think it's really important to know organic before you jump straight into biochem. What's that? That's what I'm getting at. It, it, I would say it's different. Uh, you're looking a lot at very, very complicated pathways. They're not going to spell out every single bond making and breaking step. So it's hard. It can be hard, yeah. Okay, so carboxylic acids are great hydrogen bond donors. In particular, they love to dimerize because they're both hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Um, so many of you noticed on your IR handout, you had free H bonds and um, uh, H-bonded carboxylic acids, they had different values, right? And this has to do with whether or not you're observing a dimer in the IR or free carboxylic acids. And so you actually get slightly different IR frequencies depending on that. And so if you have a very dilute carboxylic acid, it won't be as likely to dimerize. But if you have a very concentrated carboxylic acid, it will dimerize. Does anybody remember the pKa of carboxylic acids? Oh, man. It's about four to five, so Ian's, Ian's pretty close. And I'm going to put an asterisk up here because there are some things that can wildly throw the pKa's in different directions. What impacts pKa's? Induction. So it can vary based on induction. So a classic example of that is trifluoroacetic acid, where it's acetic acid with four fluorines. That actually has a pKa closer to one and a half. So that's quite a bit more acidic than, uh, than acetic acid. Or resonance. So if you're attached to a benzene ring, especially a benzene ring with an electron withdrawing group, your pKa can be much, much lower. So that's something to be aware of. All right. So at Neutral pHs, is a carboxylic acid a neutral acid, or has it already given up its proton? Why? What's the, P <laughs> What's the pKa of water? Seven. No, that's the pH of water. 15. <laughs> So the pKa of water is 15, which means that carboxylic acids are more acidic than water, which means if it's in water, it's going to donate its proton to water. And so most of the time at neutral pHs, your carboxylic acids are actually going to be carboxylate salts. 
And so if you have, whoop. You'll grab this proton, kick off electrons. And this is referred to as a carboxylate. Why are carboxylic acids so acidic? Going back to first term? Resonance, right? So we can draw a resonance structure for our carboxylate anion where that negative charge is delocalized across both oxygens. Is that an equilibrium arrow? Yeah, in this case, we can draw it as an equilibrium arrow. We can do that, but we know that the equilibrium lies far on the right. And so we can call it a carboxylate salt or carboxylate anion. All right, now let's go into a bit of review for preparation of carboxylic acids. What's one way of making a carboxylic acid? Who remembers? Kareem. Okay. So if we have a primary alcohol. So you have to have a primary alcohol, and if you need to review, this was from section 10.9 in our book. Does anybody remember another way? Potassium permanganate? Yep. So we can oxidize a benzylic position. Follow this by protonation with acid. And this was in section 18.6, if you're rusty. And this only works on benzylic positions. What other reagents could we use besides potassium permanganate? Kind of. We would first have to uh, halogenate it. But what's another oxidizing condition besides potassium permanganate? Kind of. We can just think about the uh, conditions above, right? So either of these reagents will work for the second step. You can use chromic acid for benzylic oxidation, or you can use uh, potassium permanganate. So either one of those will work. I heard a lot of other good ones, too. So I think Vasily said ozonolysis. All right. A few people said it. Adrian. Adrian said it. Yes. We'll get that on the internet so yeah. people know around the world. Good job, Adrian. <laughs> so we can cleave alkynes, and this was in section um, 10.9. All right. What's another one? So that would give us our aldehyde. <laughs> Not quite. We'll we'll get into some other ways. I I heard JD say one earlier, so I'm gonna jump into her suggestion. So before we left the last chapter, I said that we can use cyanide as a nucleophile. Cyanide can do a uh, SN2 substitution. And then we can convert this directly into a carboxylic acid. And so in this case, all you need is dilute acid and heat. So we saw this last term with cyanohydrins, 
But what I want you guys to do on your problem of the day is try to deduce the mechanism for this. And I'll give you a hint that it's very similar to the mechanisms we've seen in the last chapter. So the first step is going to involve protonation at the nitrogen. And then see if you can get from there. Yep. What's that? In this case, it's very, very favorable going uh, to the carboxylic acid. So I'm showing it as a one-way arrow. Yep. So we're going to leave this mechanism and try to have you guys figure this out for your problem of the day. Um, don't overanalyze it. Like I said, first step is protonation. And then you're going to have some nucleophilic attacks and some proton transfers. It's not going to be anything earth-shattering. So um, try to work your way through this. Hey, I can't hear you. Uh, no. In this case, we're starting just straight with our cyano group and dilute acid. With it. Was an aldehyde and what? Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do that one too. I actually didn't have that on my list, so thank you. It's usually MCPBA. M oh, yeah. It depends on the migratory aptitude for these. All right, now let's cover some new reactions. We've done a lot of review. One of them we got a sneak peek of already. And that was if we have a Grignard reagent We can toss in CO2 in our first step. So this is just literally throwing dry ice into your reaction mixture, followed by an acidic workup. Yep. Let me redraw that and make it clear. So you throw in dry ice, and then you do an acidic workup. Let's see what the mechanism looks like. You guys will like this one. It's short. All right, so we have carbon dioxide. All right, go back to our basic structure. What do you think happens? Our group attacks the carbon. Kicks up electrons onto the oxygen. So we don't normally think of carbon dioxide as being electrophilic, but it can be. So what would we call this intermediate? Yeah, carboxylate salt. Uh-oh. Ooh. All right. Boxel eight salt. And then in the next step, we just react this with an acid. And we can protonate our carboxylic acid. Why won't water work? Yeah, because we already said that carboxylic acids are more acidic than water, so you can't use water to protonate a carboxylic acid. In this case, you do have to use H3O plus in this last step. All right, and then the other new mechanism um, is on the problem of the day, which is the one I want you guys to try to work through on your own. Yep. I mean, you can use HCl and water, so like 5% hydrochloric acid would be fine. Yep. <laughs> I think it's a little unfair that we have to decide.
your arrow pushing needs to be consistent with all the rules of arrow pushing that we've seen so far. You guys, you'll be able to get there. You guys are at the point where I think you'll be able to deduce it. It'll be good practice. All right. <laughs> you just said the last reaction was easy and that I was demeaning you. All right, so reactions of carboxylic acids. We've already learned quite a few of them. Um, the easiest one... was one we've already seen. Oop, excuse me. It's a reduction, and what reagents do we need? LAH. Oop, LAH. Followed by acid again, right? Because we need to protonate our carboxylic acid. But we kind of glossed over the mechanism before, and I told you guys that we'd cover it this chapter. And the mechanism for this is, I think, fascinating because there's still research being done on it, even though it's a fairly basic mechanism. We learned this for aldehydes and ketones. So the problem we run into, I guess not problem, is we've got a hydride source that's H minus. That's a good base, right? So what's the first step going to be? Deprotonation. So in this step, our hydride will attack a proton. Let me slide this over a bit. And then we get H2 gas bubbling out. Yep, which means this is not in equilibrium. But now we've got a unique situation occurring. Actually, I apologize. I'm going to change the orientation for this to make it more clear. I'll move this here. There we go. I like this better. So it's still the same. Al H3. But in this case, what's special about the aluminum? It's the p orbital. It's very, very electrophilic. It wants electrons because now it's uh, sp2 hybridized. So in this case, the oxygen will give up or donate some of its lone pairs from the carbonyl. Because what happens next? is when it does that, it's going to polarize that CO double bond. And then this hydrogen will pop in there. And then in the next step, we can eject this off. We're not quite done yet. It has any a positive charge? No. Nope. Yeah, it's a strange leaving group. And we've got an aldehyde. But the aldehyde, we can't stop there. Aldehydes are super, super reactive. And so it's assumed that you do this with excess lithium aluminum hydride. And I'll tell you guys kind of my beef with this reaction too once we're done.
and we can show our last protonation. And we get to our primary alcohol. All right, my beef with this reaction is if you look up through the full mechanism, I show the aluminum participating. The lithium is not doing anything, right? The lithium is just a counter cation. But what they're finding out recently is if you take a crown ether that traps that lithium in a crown ether, this reaction won't work. So there's actually been changes in the mechanistic theory behind this, and it gets super complicated. Um, but the important thing I wanted you guys to take away from this is that this is just a proposed mechanism. We're finding out more and more that it's not the full story and that the lithium actually participates very heavily in this reaction. Yeah? Shouldn't the arrows of the double bond moving up? Or if you're going oh. from the... Right here? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I should have shown that. Um, so it, it is really interesting. It actually forms kind of a lithium sandwich complex between all of this stuff, and it gets into crazy organometallic chemistry. So we're just going to gloss over that. He mentions it in the book um, briefly, but doesn't go into detail and leaves the simplistic mechanism in his book. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of these mechanisms, they're true until somebody disproves them. Um, and then we come up with a new mechanism that aligns better with experimental uh, data. Can you explain that second step a little more? So the second step, what happens is the lone pair on this oxygen coordinates to the empty p orbital. At the same time, a hydride gets transferred into the electrophilic side. Is there induction? Um, with this step? No, with the, the hydride. No, hyd hydrides like jumping off and attacking electrophilic centers, because you can think of this as H minus. Okay. Yeah. And during this um, mechanism, it's still a little unclear exactly what's going on. Um, and it actually has a lot to do with solvent. Um, and we're just not going to get super far into that. All right, there's one other alternate reaction I wanted to leave you guys with. And this is one that's actually gained a lot of popularity because of how easy it is. And this uses a borane complex. So borane is complex to THF, which is a solvent, and it can reduce this directly to an alcohol. The cool thing with this is it will only reduce carboxylic acids. It won't reduce ketones or aldehydes. So an example of this would be, let's say we have a benzoic acid derivative. And we do BH3 THF. It'll selectively reduce the carboxylic acid and leave the ketone alone. Nope. We don't need to know the mechanism for this reaction. It's not one that's covered in our book, and I'm not going to expect you guys to know it. Um, but it is very helpful for selective reduction. So we can selectively reduce aldehydes over carboxylic acids, and we can selectively reduce carboxylic acids over aldehydes and ketones now. So we can do selective chemistry a little bit better. All right, when we come back tomorrow, we'll start on to um, carboxylic acid derivatives. This is uh, more or less the chunk that just focuses on carboxylic acids.